Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Learn to Code LA's Basic Linux Skills class. The first part of a series for infrastructure, basically learning how to take your code and turn it into a website. Um, I'm Beej, I'll be teaching this class. Uh, if you've been in contact with us while we were setting up this class, uh, you're probably kind of surprised that this is recording in my room. I kind of messed up the recording at the actual event, so I'm doing it after the fact. I'm going to try to follow as closely as I can to what was happening in the event. I switched around the order of a couple of things because it makes just a little more sense. Uh, but beyond that, the contents will be nearly identical in terms of the knowledge transfer. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first thing I'd like to cover is a disclaimer. This class is opinionated. What that means is that there are many tools that can do the things we're doing equally as effectively. But due to simply the knowledge I have and time constraints, we're only selecting one of these tools at a time. I have to teach you somehow, right? Um, for example, we'll be using Amazon Web Services to set to acquire our servers from. Uh, there are other services that do this. There's Heroku, there's virtual private servers. There are a number of different ways to achieve this. Additionally, we're using um, Linux. You can also use Windows servers instead of Linux. Even Apple has servers. Additionally, we'll be using um, Red Hat Linux when there are plenty of other versions. CentOS, Ubuntu, uh, Gentoo, SUSE, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, in, in short, there are many other ways to do this, so you should feel free to explore. Try other products. You may like them more than what we use here. So now we're going to get started. Um, in the event that you're watching this after the fact and you're not tied into the meetup, I'm going to show you the tools that we're going to use if you're on Windows. If you're on Mac, feel free to skip this part. The tools that you need are already built in. So for Windows, what we're going to look for is PuTTY. And we're going to download PuTTY, a free SSH and Telnet client for Windows. And the way that this works is it's just an individual little executable file, right? It's just PuTTY.exe and PuTTYGen.exe. These are the two we'll be using. I'm not actually going to download them because I already have them. Additionally, there is WinSCP. SCP is a way to transfer files. We'll need to do this during the class. And what you want to do is you want to download this installation package right here. This is an executable file. It will install a piece of software. Um, just be prepared for that. This is safe. I've been using it for years. It's not going to give you a virus or anything like that. So download these tools. Um, again, the PuTTY ones are executables that can be used straight away. Uh, for WinSCP, this is an installation package. It will take you through an installation wizard, which you've probably seen similar things before. Um, that's what you should expect. Again, for Mac, uh, the tools that you need are built in. Mac is derived from Unix. Linux is also derived from Unix, hence the similarity in name. Um, so the, the tools that you need to connect to the server to transfer files are already built into the operating system. This is why you'll see many developers with Macs. However, not everyone uses that. Not saying that every developer should go out there and buy a Mac. It's a matter of preference. I personally don't use a Mac. However, I have enjoyed using one in the past. But less on that. More getting started. So once you have those tools, um, as I mentioned before, we're going to be using Amazon Web Services to acquire our servers. All right, so you can reach us by aws.amazon.com, and you'll see a page like this. Now, if you use Amazon for shopping, it's the same account. Um, if you don't use Amazon for shopping, you'll need to create one. You will also need to provide your credit card info. For the class, I provided um, a number of instances myself so that people didn't have to enter their credit card info at the meetup. Uh, however, if you're catching this after the fact, you will need to set up the server yourself because, well, I'm not there to set it up for you. So I will walk you through how to do that. Uh, and first, you need to log in. Um, so you're going to sign in. And once you've done that, you will reach the Amazon Web Services console. This is massive. Amazon provides a large number of products and services. Don't get discouraged. We're only going to be using one for now. Uh, but a brief overview of what's available. They have computing services, basically ways that you can get a computer to run something. And they also have uh, storage services. You can use S3 to serve websites from or to store files. They have um, 
Well, they have a number of things. They also have databases. Um, RDS and DynamoDB are um, relational databases and not only SQL databases. Uh, and the list goes on and on. If you want to learn about these things, I recommend reading up on them. Amazon provides plenty of documentation. What we'll be using, however, is EC2. But before we get there, you'll notice that EC2 says servers in the cloud. What is the cloud? Everyone's like, oh, the cloud, it gives us everything we need. It's nothing magical. The cloud is just a way of having virtual servers. Um, technically, anything that's a computer could act as a server. The definition of a server is that your application, or sometimes they say the machine, is serving information to other applications or machines. So your laptop, your desktop, could act as a server. If you have something that you'll respond to a request over a network, congratulations, you have a server. Um, now, the cloud is simply a whole bunch of machines with virtual servers, basically servers where they're not tied to the machine and you can spin them up on multiple machines. So when we say the cloud, we mean a bunch of uh, virtual servers that can move around the physical hardware that they actually live on. It's a little difficult to understand at first. Hopefully by the end of this series you'll have an understanding. Um, in this specific class we're not going to go into that at all really, so I'm just going to ask you to be patient there. Now I mentioned that these virtual servers still live on physical hardware. The reason that matters is because physical hardware has to live somewhere on this planet, right? Amazon has, if you look at the screen here, availability zones. These are places where that physical hardware, where that cloud resides. They have regions all over the world. You can see anything from Sydney to Seoul to Oregon. Um, in this case, uh, we had machines distributed between North Cal Northern California and Oregon. Um, I had to use two zones because by default you're capped at 20 instances. Uh, so you, if you are elsewhere, or you're serving people elsewhere, you may want to consider standing up your infrastructure in different availability zones. But for now, we'll stick with Oregon because that's close enough. Now we're going to be using EC2. EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cluster, two Cs, right? Um, that's really just fancy terms for servers that you can turn on and turn off and create new ones and delete ones elastically, right? At, at will, very, very smoothly. Your, your compute ability, the power of computers you have, is easily changed. So we're going to go ahead and click this, and we'll be brought to the EC2 dashboard. Now all these numbers will be zeros for you, but these are basically all the resources that we have available to us. Again, we're very focused on this class, so we're not going to cover everything here. For now, you want to launch an instance. If we're going to learn how to use a Linux server, well, we need to have one to use. So I'm going to click Launch Instance here. And now you'll be brought to the wizard. You can see the steps up top here. Now, these are all very viable options. Amazon provides a number of different servers. I mentioned earlier that you could use Windows or Linux. These are all different flavors of Linux, and you can see the various Windows versions as well. For this class, we'll be using Red Hat. That's just one of many versions. Feel free to explore. So we're going to select that. Now, I mentioned earlier that these are virtual computers, right? So they, like any other computer, have um, CPUs, memory, and disk, uh, and network. Just, just like the laptop or desktop that you're on right now, or maybe even a Chromebook or tablet or phone, who knows. So what we've selected here, and what is selected by default, is the micro instance. Basically has one CPU, one gig of memory, and it's eligible to be free. So we're just going to roll with that for now. We're going to hit review and launch, because we don't need to go through the whole wizard for purposes of this. Now, one thing we do want to check out is security groups. Security groups are how you define, well, the security for a group of servers. In this case, we're only launching one. However, we could launch many if we wanted to. So if we're setting up a security, if we're setting up a server, that we want to serve websites, for example, we need to allow website traffic. Now you see this type here in protocol. How would you know which one to select? Well, when you visit websites, if you look at your address bar up at the top here, 
you'll see that it starts with HTTPS. That is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, or over SSL. Um, you've probably also seen with just the HTTP and not with the S. These are the protocols that browsers use to connect to web servers and download websites from them. So we need to make sure that these servers that we're creating can be reached by other computers over those protocols. So we're going to hit Edit Security Groups. And we're going to hit Add Rule twice. Reason being is we need to allow HTTP and HTTPS. Now if you look at this list, there's a whole bunch of different protocols. And again, we're not going to cover all of these because they're outside the scope of this class. However, I encourage you to be curious. If something looks interesting, go ahead and look it up. Now there's going to be no additional configuration needed here. However, what we could do is let's say that we only wanted to accept web traffic from some set of IP addresses, which correlates to some place in the world or some services, right? Or if you're working as part of a corporate office, maybe that corporate office only has one address. You want to allow only from there. Um, you could say only allow a custom IP address. However, in this case, a web server isn't very much of a web server if people across the world can't access it, so we're going to leave this as anywhere. Now, I've kind of ignored this until now. You'll see this type SSH. SSH is short for Secure Shell. It's how we're going to connect to our server to make changes. Now, ideally, if you're in an office location or somewhere where you have control over your internet connection, you would want to make sure that you had a custom IP that was just your office's IP address. I know I haven't explained what an IP address is yet, we'll get there shortly. However, since we can't guarantee where you'll be when you'll run this, we're just going to have to allow anyone to attempt to connect to our server. Now, if you're security minded, you should be freaking out right now, but we're going to have some security mem we're going to have some security measures put in place to make sure we got this covered. So for now, we're going to go ahead and hit review and launch to bring us back to the launch prompt. You'll see this warning about security group and that it's open to the world. We know that we're doing this, don't worry. They do have, this is a fair warning though, but this is okay for our purposes right now. I don't recommend that you allow your production instances to be this open, but this should suffice for the time being. Now at this point, we're going to hit launch. And we'll be prompted with this key pair right here. Now, you're probably wondering what a key pair is. Key pairs are composed of a public key and a private key, and these are manifested in files. These files are just text files, and if you open them up with a text editor, they just look like gibberish, and that's intentional. They're, these keys are involved in security. Your public key is equivalent to your name, your legal name, for example. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it's equivalent to. We're using a metaphor here. And you can tell people your name freely, right? Like I told you at the beginning of this video, my name is Beege, or if we're using the public key example, Brian Berry. I can give you that information freely, and the likelihood that you're able to impersonate me out on the street is, well, with someone that knows who I am, is pretty unlikely. A private key. If a public key is your legal name, the private key is your driver's license. That proves that you are who you say you are. Now for that reason, your private key is called a private key. By that I mean you should not share your private key with anyone. I'm going to say that again. You should not share your private key with anyone. That's like giving someone your driver's license or passport. If you manage to leak a private key out to the internet or give it to someone you don't trust, that's a great way to get fired from a company. Do not share private key files. Very scary. Don't do it. Hold on to those. Make sure they're in a secure place. Now, now that you have this word of warning, we're going to go ahead and create a new key pair. Now it's going to give us a private key file that we'll download, and we'll use this to log into the server. I'll explain how that works towards the end of the class, so you're just going to have to roll with it for now. So in this case, we're going to call it recording key. 
because I have a bunch of keys and I don't want to get it confused. Now you need to make sure to hit download this key pair. The launch instance button will actually be blocked out until you do this because if you launch the instance without a key to get in, it's like trying to get into a house. You can't get into a house without your keys. <laughs> there are other ways to log into servers, however, using public-private key pairs is the recommended way, at least in publicly facing networks. If you're inside a corporate network and you have uh, hosts that or servers that are only accessed from internally, using usernames and passwords is usually safe enough. However, keys are much, much, much more secure. And I'll show you why in a couple of minutes. So you're going to hit download key pair. And you're not actually going to download the pair, you're just going to download the private key. You don't need the public key, and again, you'll see why towards the end of the class. But now that you have that key, note where it is, and we're going to go ahead and use that key in a couple of moments. But after this, you want to click Launch Instances. And you should see a message like this, your instances are now launching. Now it doesn't say that the instance is available to use. It takes a few moments for the computer to boot up, just like your laptop or desktop. Again, a server is just like a laptop or desktop, except that it's meant to serve data to other devices across a network. Okay. So now that we've got that done, let's go ahead and take this key. Now if you're a Mac user, um, you should probably just go ahead and skip this portion for now. Um, you'll know when it's time for you to watch again when you see a black screen with green text. That'll be the giveaway that it's Mac time. Now, where did I download this to? Okay, here we go. This will work. So, if you're on Windows, you want to follow along. This is the key that I just downloaded. This is the private key. Like I mentioned earlier, it, um, yeah, let's not do it that way. Like I mentioned earlier, private key is just a text file. So if we open this one up, you'll see that I'm going to delete this at the end of this recording because you shouldn't be able to see this, right? Because this was effectively giving you my private key. However, for demonstration purposes, this is the private key. It's a lot of text. Why is it more secure than usernames and passwords? I don't think a person can remember that main character is very easily. Additionally, if a computer were to brute force it, that's, um, let's see, what do we got? 1608 characters selected. It would take a computer a long time to brute force that, especially since it has alphabetical characters, numbers, and even some symbols here and there. So again, very secure. Now, what we will want to do is open up putty gen. Ooh, I have too much stuff open. We want to open up that putty gen application that we had earlier. Okay, So go ahead and do that now. And once you've got that done, you're going to click conversions here up at the top. And then you're going to select import key. Once you've done that, you want to navigate to wherever you downloaded the key to. And for instance, here's my recording key.pem, and you'll want to select that. And you should see all this nonsense to indicate that the key has successfully been loaded. At this point, you want to save the private key. Now, why are we doing this if we already have a private key? Well, because Windows. Um, the keys that were generated can't be used by PuTTY. PuTTY requires its own special format in order to connect to the server using keys. So what we're effectively doing here is converting the key. So you're going to be prompted here, are you sure you want to save this key without a passphrase? You can secure a key with a passphrase. What does that mean? That means that any time you want to use the key to log into somewhere, you're going to be prompted for a password. Now, it is extra security, but honestly I don't see it done that often. And if you ever want to automate anything with your login, the passphrase is going to make that much, much harder. And honestly almost impossible. I've done it before, it kind of sucks. So we're going to say that yes we want to save this key without a passphrase. It is added security but it's a little more than we need to do. So we're going to call this recording key and because I'm on Windows if, if I didn't have file extensions shown like .ppk 
it might be difficult to tell which one is which. However, you can name it differently if you don't have file extension showing. So we're going to hit save. And now you see the file here. Now that's all we're going to need of Putty Gen for now. We'll open it up again later on, but for now, we don't need it. Alright, at this point, we can open up Putty. Now Putty is what we're going to use to actually connect to our server over SSH, which I described earlier. However, we need to know where the server is. So we're going to go back to our console. And you'll see the following instances have been initiated. By now, it should be ready. So we can go ahead and click this, and we'll be brought back to the instance portion of the dashboard. It'll already be filtered for the instance that you set up in case you have multiple servers set up. And then you'll want to find this public IP address. Don't look for private, you want the public IP address. And you'll want to take this, and you'll want to copy it. Of course, you can't right click, so you're going to have to take Control C if you're not terribly shortcut savvy. Alternatively, you can highlight it down here and copy it from here. Then you can go back into Putty. From there, you want to paste that value into here. Again, keyboard shortcuts, Control V if you're not familiar. But then we need to tell Putty, hey, we want to use that key that we generated. So on the left side, you're going to go down to SSH and you're going to expand it. And you're going to select Auth. You'll see this private key file for authentication. You're going to hit Browse and select the key that you had set up. In this case, it's my recording key.ppk, the one that we had exported from PuttyGen. I'm going to hit Open. And now you see that the path to that key is here. From there, we can go back up to Session. And what you'll want to do for ease is under the Save Sessions, you'll want to enter a name. And you'll want to hit Save. Now, if we were to change any of this, we can just select here and click load, and whatever values we had will be replaced again. Now, I'm going to make one more change. You won't need to do this, but for purposes of the recording, I'm actually going to make the font a little bit bigger, just to ensure that you can see it clearly. Okay, and then, as mentioned before, I'm going to save over that. Cool. So now at this point, you should be able to hit open, and you'll get a warning. Now, this warning is basically stating that, hey, I, Putty, haven't ever seen the server before. I don't know who this is. We're trying to make a secure connection to it, but I don't know if I trust this person since I've never seen them before, this person being the server. And it's asking if you trust this server. And if you hit yes, it will remember that, and then it won't bother you again. It'll remember that we trust this server. So we're going to hit yes because we know exactly what server we're connecting to. Okay, now we're going to see this login as. Now, this is kind of this kind of bothers me because Amazon doesn't necessarily tell you about this, but the user that it set us up with was the EC2 dash user. So if you enter that in, you'll see we get authenticating with public key because we provided the private key. And now we're logged in. Congratulations, you connected to your first server over SSH or Secure Shell. Now, let's actually get, well, now we're going to go ahead and flip over to the Mac side so that we can continue on. All right, Mac folks.
All right, Mac folks. Whoop. All right, Mac folks. You should re be rejoining us right now so that we can get you connected to the server. Now, I'm going to be using a Linux virtual machine that I have, uh, simply because this is what I have access to. I don't own a Mac. And I have the Mac equivalent of a terminal set up. If you're on a Mac, what you'll need to do is you'll need to go up to the top right hand corner, and again, I don't have this because I'm not on a Mac, but you should see a magnifying glass. That's Spotlight. That's a way to find things that are on your computer. If you click that magnifying glass, you should get a little text box, and you should be able to enter text into that. You'll want to type in Terminal. And when you open that, you should pop up with something similar to this, but instead of a black background with green text, it should be a white background with black text. This is your terminal. This is similar to how we'll be working with the server once we log in. However, we're going to be using the server just for ease, and that way for consistency, too. Now, it's a lot easier for you to log in than Windows, folks, because, again, you have the tools built in already. So the commands we're going to use are SSH, or Secure Shell, and you're going to do dash I. Dash I is saying, hey, we want to use an identity file, or in this case, our private key. And what you want to do is you want to click your private key and drag it from wherever you had downloaded it to into here. And then you'll see it'll put this path in here for the private key. And then you want to use the IP address of the server that you found, that you created. So the way that you'll do this is from, from the launch instance, oh man, from the launch, oh, From the launch screen, you should have seen launch instances, and then it should have had a little link to some something that looks like this, like an i-something-something-something. Something. When you click that, it'll bring you to this page here, back in the EC2 instance dashboard. What you'll want to do is you'll want to grab the public IP from here. Okay, so you want to highlight that, right-click copy, or uh, Command-C if you're on a Mac. And then you want to go back to your prompt, and you want to command V to paste, or you can right click and hit paste as well. Or control command click, control click, I forget which the equivalent of right click is on a Mac if you have a one button mouse, but there you go. And then your command should look something like this, SSH dash I, some location where, woo, some location where your key file is, followed by the IP address. However, there's one more step. We need to say ec2-user at that IP address. Why? Because when Amazon created the server for us and created that private key, the key was for a user called ec2-user. And we're just telling it we're going to log in as this person. So if we do this, you're going to get a little warning. This warning is saying, hey, you're trying to connect to the server, but we've never seen it before. Are you sure you trust it? You don't just want to open your door to someone that you haven't seen before. So it, And you also, as the person connecting, don't want to go into someone's house that you don't trust. So this is saying, hey, are you sure you want to connect to the server? You haven't seen them before. Do you trust them? In this case, we know this is the server that we created. So we can type in yes, because we trust them. Now, you might get this error. Um, if you do get this error, it means that uh, basically the system is complaining that the key is not protected. Now, we didn't run into this issue on the Max at the meetup, so you may be able to skip this part, but in the event you do see this, I'll give you the command to fix it. You want to do chmod 400, and then you want to, again, click and drag the file so that you get the path. Okay, don't worry about what chmod 400 means for now, we'll cover it much later on. Once you've done that, you can hit up to scroll through your previous commands, and then you should go back to your SSH command, hit enter, 
and magic. Congratulations! You logged into your Linux server for the first time. So, now at this point, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to go back to the Windows sides, and that's probably what the majority of users will be on. Um, if you're on the Mac, stick with what you got. You should be fine. Okay. So now we're finally ready to get started. Now you have this big black, or if you're on a Mac, white screen, and you have all this text. And you're probably not entirely sure what it means. So what 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 do we do? What do? Well, we're going to cover that. So first we're going to cover navigating around the server. On Windows and Mac, you have an interface, basically a visual, a GUI, a graphical user interface that you interact with things on your system through. Uh, in Windows, it's called Windows Explorer, or just Explorer, which is different from Internet Explorer. On Mac, this is called Finder. And this is normally how you access things. For example, this little page right here, right? And I can go ahead and click around, and this is how I can navigate through things. I can also, I can also double click, I can find something that's okay to go into. I can also double click folders to go in and out of them. And I can click up here to go up folders, right? There's ways to do this in the terminal as well. It's just sli slightly different. Slightly? Slightly different. Since we don't have a mouse to click in here, we're going to have to use text. So what this requires is basically some existing knowledge that I'm going to give you. Okay, so the first command that I'm going to teach you is pwd, or print working directory, just like this. What pwd does, whoop, oh, uh-oh, uh-oh, So we're going to do PWD, or Print Working Directory. Now, what is Working Directory? Working Directory is where we currently are. When you're using the File Explorer in Windows, it's basically the equivalent of this path right here, right? It's telling you where you are on the computer. So if I were to go to Documents, or, geez, come on, uh, let's do this. Here we go. It would say some path to the folder that I'm in. This is equivalent on Linux. This is a path as well. However, what's what's a path? When you say path, what do you mean? Well, computer file systems, or the way that files and folders as we know them are stored, is metaphorically a tree. And this is commonly used when talking about paths and file systems. The tree begins with the roots, and then as you go further up the tree, in this case we actually call it down the path, but roll with me for a second, as you go up the tree you'll come across branches. You can have branches branching off into branches branching off into branches. The file system is the same way. When you see this first slash here, this is the root, that's the base of the file system every other file and folder is inside of the root folder. Every time you see a slash when you're looking at a path it indicates that you're changing folders. Okay, So we start with the root and then we go into home and now we're in the EC2 user folder. Okay, So that's our present working directory. We're in the EC2 folder of the home folder on the root. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now. It'll make a little more sense in a little bit once we start navigating. 
Okay, so this is a great way to figure out where you are. Now, the home directory, you're probably wondering what exactly that is. Generally, again, this isn't always the case, but generally, every user on a system gets their own home folder, basically their own little private space where they can have files and do scratch work and these sorts of things. In this case, since we're logged in as the EC2 user, we have our own home folder and that's where we are. It's also where you are located on the file system when you first log into the machine. Since we just connected to this machine, that's why we're in the home folder. Now, we're going to make our first file. Linux has a command called touch. Touch creates an empty file with the name that you give it. The way that you give it a name is by writing the command touch, followed by a space, followed by the file name. Now, I recommend that you don't put spaces in your file name. The reason being is that spaces for commands are ways to distinguish arguments or inputs. Inputs and arguments are effectively the same. Um, I'll show you what exactly that means in a little bit. We'll have examples of where we use multiple arguments, but for now, just roll with it. So you want to avoid spaces in your file name. So we're going to use underscores instead, and we're going to say my new file. Okay. Now, you are probably just hit enter. Enter like, okay, I thought you said this would make a new file. What just happened? Well, it did. One of the philosophies around Linux is that if everything goes smoothly, be quiet. There's no reason to pollute your text here with unnecessary things. So the fact that it worked, and it worked as expected, is just going to remain quiet. Now, this is not to say that everything always works this way. Someone had to write this touch program, and that's how they made it behave. You could write your own programs in the future and decide you want them to behave differently. That's totally cool, but in the world of Linux, many of the utilities, unless the utility specifically is dedicated to creating output, be pretty quiet. So, now that we've created this new file, how do we see it? How do we, where is it? What does it look like? Well, there's another command. It's called ls. It's to list the contents of a directory. When you don't give it any arguments, it lists the contents of the current directory. So we can just type ls and hit enter. And now you'll see my new file. Okay. So far so good, we've created our first file and we can see it. Now, is that the only file in our home directory? Not necessarily, there's actually a whole lot more. We can see more files if we type in ls, hit space, and then we add a dash a, or hyphen a. Now, why are we doing this? What does this mean? Most commands have flags. Flags are different ways to configure the command, if you will. It's ways to change its normal behavior. In this case, the dash A flag is short for all. And instead of just showing some of the files that are in the directory, it shows all of them. In Linux, files that start with a dot are by default hidden. When you add a dash A, since we're telling it to show all files, it will show these hidden files. Now we're not going to cover what these files are right now. Later on we will, but don't worry about it right this second. Okay. Now, you're probably like, crap, okay, so I get that someone has to tell me that ls exists, but how am I supposed to know what all these flags are? This is a ton of information. How does anyone ever learn this? Well, fortunately, there's there's easier ways to kind of get a hold of this information. The next command I want to show you is called man. It's an excellent command, not because it's manly though. It kind of isn't. It's short for manual. And how many men do you know like to read manuals, right? Now man is a way to see manual pages for a command. So if we do man, space, and then the ls command, what we'll see is essentially instructions on how the ls command works. We can see the name of the command, we can see a synopsis of how to run it, and a description of what it does and how it does it. You can use the arrow keys to scroll down, 
And here we can see the dash a command. In this case, it says dash dash all. That's another way that you can write it. When you see a comma like this, it means that there's multiple ways that you can activate this behavior. And these are the two different ways to do so. And then it describes the different behavior. Do not ignore entries starting with a dot. Remember those hidden files I mentioned earlier? This is how you expose them. There's another one we're going to use. If you keep scrolling down, you're going to look for dash L. Dash L is to use a long listing format. This is very useful. Now, you're probably like, cool, all right, I can read through all these pages and figure out, you know, how to do the stuff. I can do the things. But what if I want to get out of here? Well, look at the bottom. You can press Q to quit. So just hit Q on your keyboard, and you're back to normal. Now, we can do L. Now, here's the thing, too. With flags, you can combine them. You can do ls space dash a l, and this will bring about the behavior of both the a flag and the l flag. So now we can see all of the files, including the ones that start with a dot, and the long list format. You're probably like, holy crap, that's a lot of stuff. What is it? It's a lot simpler than it, well, kind of. Some of it is. These are the permissions for the file. We're not going to cover permissions this time. We're going to go over it later. It's a little bit confusing. This, I forget what it was. Someone in the class corrected me on what it was. I've never found reason to actually remember what it actually is. Whatever. This is the user that owns the file. This is the group that owns the file. Yes, Linux has user groups, and we'll be covering that in another class. This is the size of the file generally. Not always. Sometimes it's not always accurate. You notice that my new file, the file that we created, is empty because we didn't put anything inside it. And the size is in bytes. This is the last date that the file was modified. This is also common on Windows and I believe OS X. Followed by the file name itself. And this is the long format. You can read more about what all this means on the interwebs. You have the Googles. You can use them. All right. So now we've shown flags. We've shown hidden things. Now maybe maybe we don't want this file that we created. Maybe we decided we don't need it anymore. We just want to clean up things. There is a way to remove this file. There's a command called rm, short for remove. And it takes in one argument, just like touch does and it's the name of the file that you want to remove. Also, here's a cool trick. If you start typing a file name, you can hit tab, and if that file exists, if the, op if the shell knows about it, it'll complete it for you. Then we can hit enter, and again, Linux world, if everything is going smoothly and there's nothing to complain about, nothing will be output. Now if we lsal again, you'll see that my new file is again missing from the list. And we could always recreate it with just touch again. I'm going to go ahead and recreate it now because we will use it later. But we want uh, my new file, not mu new file. That's uh, a little, little unusual. Now, there is something I want to make you highly, highly, highly aware of. RM has a few flags, one of which is the dash F flag. This is short for force. There are cases where RM will actually prompt you, do you really want to delete this file? If you hit force, it will not prompt you to do that, and it will delete the file without asking any questions. Now, normally this isn't a huge deal alone, but there's another flag, dash R, for recursive. This is useful if you're trying to delete a directory. What will happen is, let's say that you have one directory with several directories inside it. If you were to rm-r, it would descend into each of those directories till it gets to the bottom, and then delete that one, and then delete the parent, and then delete the parent of that until it gets back up to where you called it. This is a recursive operation. When you combine the two, it deletes everything in a given folder without asking questions. Now if you do rm-rf and you add a slash at the end, remember the file system metaphor earlier, where the file system is a tree? and everything er, ascends from the root. If you were to do this, you would delete every single file on your server. 
and your server would not be much of a server anymore. If you go into certain communication channels like IRC or other such things, people might jokingly tell you, oh yeah, sudo rmrf slash will fix your problem. They're lying. This will in fact blow up your machine and make it completely unusable. So be aware of this, be careful, and stay away from it. However, this is a great segue to the next little trick. Uh, the terminal, the shell here, has a couple of nice little shortcuts. Uh, one of which is Control C. Whoa. There we go, that was weird. Control C basically cancels whatever's currently running. So if you're running a script and it has an infinite loop and you're like, no, I don't want you to run forever, you can do Control C and it will send a termination signal to the process. A termination signal is actually a very specific term, but we're not going to go too deeply into that. More often than not, a termination signal will stop whatever process is, is currently running. In the case of the shell, if you do control C, it will cancel whatever current command is being written, just like we've done here. We didn't have to hit enter, we didn't have to backspace all, backspace all the way, we can just control C and we get the hell out of dodge. Okay? So that is how we can remove files. Next up, we've seen that, okay, we, we are in this directory, we have an idea of what the file system looks like, but in Windows, on Explorer or on Mac on Finder you have a way to navigate among folders. You can go inside folders, you can go up out of folders. You can do that in Linux too. The command for that is CD or change directory. Now what I can do is remember earlier if we do PWD to print our working directory again you'll see home EC2 user. If I were to change directory to slash home now we're to ls, we can see the ec2 user directory because it is inside of the slash home directory. If we do print working directory, we can see that instead of being in slash home slash ec2 user, we are now simply in slash home. Now, you'll also notice that something along this text changed. This body of text is called our prompt. When we're in the shell, when we're in the terminal, the prompt gives us a good amount of information so that we kind of have an idea of what's going on and where we're at. This first portion here is the user that we're currently logged in as. It's followed by the host name or the name that the server thinks it has. And lastly is the directory, the folder, that we're currently in. So you're probably wondering, okay, so what the hell is this tilde? The tilde represents the home directory of the user you're currently logged in as. So since slash home slash ec2 user is the ec2 user's home directory, whenever we're inside that directory, we just see a tilde. It's just an alias, it's a shortcut. Um, you can use it in place of slash home slash ec2 user at any time, assuming you're logged in as ec2 user, and it's just a little shortcut that you have to memorize. So now that we're in the slash home directory, I want to show you another feature of ls. We can use ls to list the contents of the current directory, but we can also use it to list the contents of other directories. If we do ls, and then we provide as an argument to it ec2-user, and we go ahead and hit enter, it'll show us the contents of the ec2-user directory. Now something to be clear about. We can only give it the EC2 user directory because we're currently in the slash home directory. Because when we're in home, the EC2 user directory is directly visible to us. Now what if we weren't in the slash home directory? What if we were somewhere else? Let's say we were at the root. If we were to try to ls EC2 user, it would have no idea what we were talking about. And the reason for that is when we enter just a path like this, just EC2 user, it's relative to our current location. So because we're in home, EC2 user is directly visible to us. If we were to go anywhere else on the file system, EC2 user is not readily visible to us. What we're doing when we're referencing one path, and it's dependent on where we currently are, it's called a relative path. We could also list the contents of it in an absolute manner. So here's the reference path. If we were to give it the full path to that directory, you'll see that we get the same result. 
it's the same directory we're simply describing it in a different way this is the absolute way to write a directory this location never changes is absolute starting from the root this is dependent on where we currently are we can only use this if we're currently in that directory now there's something else I can show you too regarding listing directories and directory hierarchy if we look at the slash home directory where we currently are you'll see that in addition to the EC2 user folder we have this dot and this dot 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 represents the current directory dot dot represents the parent directory so if we do ls without any parameters if we do ls space dot it's effectively the same thing we're just listing the contents of the current directory if we were to list dot dot that would be the parent directory in this case that would be root and root has a lot of stuff in it including the home directory that we're currently in so this is a way to navigate and to view relative to where we currently are I can cd dot dot to go back up to root from there I can cd to home and I can also cd to slash home slash ec2 dash user and this all just works so this is absolute and relative pathing again absolute pathing is referencing from the root of the file system to wherever you want to go to and relative pathing is relative to your current location so now that we've got kind of navigation down let's do some more file manipulations we know how to create a file we know how to remove a file but how about renaming or moving a file there's a command called move or MV for short and that allows us to rename files and move them now in Linux there is nothing dedicated to renaming moving a file is the same as renaming it so MV takes in two arguments the first is the the file that you want to change or move in this case it's my new file and we can go ahead and move it to the same location but with a different name calling it my moved file now if we were to list the contents of this directory you'll see that we no longer see my new file we now see my moved file because we renamed it we moved it from one file name to a new file name we can also copy files that command is CP for short so if we do copy my moved file and the second argument being the name of the file we want to copy it to we can do my copied file it works very similarly to the MV command except that instead of moving one file to another it makes a copy so now we can see my copied file and my moved file very simple no surprise now there's a directory I want to tell you about it's kind of a safe scratch space it's called slash var slash tmp or slash temp and this directory is kind of a scratch space for any and all users all users have access to it and it's generally understood that anything that's in here is trash and safe to delete it's just kind of a working space now that said you shouldn't put any sensitive files in this location for example your private key which we've described before you generally wouldn't want to put it here there are exceptions of course but you want to be very careful moving private files around and this is one of the places you do not want to move them to however for purposes of demonstrating these other commands with these empty files we have we're gonna go ahead and use that scratch space because you can also move and copy files from one location to another so we can take my moved file and we can copy it I'm sorry we can move it to slash bar slash temp now here's a cool thing when you're moving among directories if you just put the directory name the move command will be smart enough to go they didn't provide a new file name so I'm going to keep the same file name and simply move this file to that directory so if we run that and then we list the contents of slash var slash tmp you'll see my moved file there we can also do this with copy it works the same way we can do my copied file and we can say slash var slash tmp 
But to demonstrate that we can change the name, I'm going to call it TMP file. Now if we list the contents, we'll see both my mood file and my TMP file. And since we copied my copied file instead of moving it, we still have my copied file. This is pretty simple stuff and I'm sure you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly. Now we're going to move on to things to set up our new user. I'm going to show you a very, very terrifying command. Okay? You need to be very careful with this. It's called sudo. It's short for switch user do. By default, it switches to the super user. Some people also call it, call it super user do. The super user can do anything. It doesn't need any sort of special permissions. It is the special permissions. It is essentially the administrative user of the server and can access any file anywhere. So you need to be careful with this. However, it's very useful when administering a server. For our purposes of our next task, we're going to create a new user, which you'll eventually use to log in, create a public-private key pair for it, much like the one we've used for this EC2 user, and then make sure that you can, well, we won't get to that for this class because we didn't finish it within the meetup, but we'll prepare you for logging in with that new user. Now, creating new users is not something that anyone can do, otherwise, well, servers would get polluted pretty quickly. Creating users is something only the super user can do, or someone that has been granted explicit elevated privileges to run the user add command, which is what we'll be using to create a new user. So to do this we can do sudo user add and then the name of the user we want to create. In this case I'm just going to use my name. I recommend you use your name or whatever you want. It's just a username. It doesn't matter. So if we hit this I'm recording this for the second time and I'll just have to show you another command, user del. So now if we do user add, we can see that it's created my beige user. The way that we can check this is we can list the contents of the home directory. Now this is not the guaranteed way to check that a user exists. It's just one of the many ways to do so. This will only show us interactive users that have had a home directory made for them. You can also make interactive users without home directories. However, that is the default behavior, is including the home directory. So now, you'll see that in the home directory, the user beige has its own folder. Now, if we're going to be using this user instead of the EC2 user in the future, we need to make sure that this user also has elevated privileges. There's a file called sudoers, and it defines which users are capable of elevated privileges and which commands they can use with those elevated privileges. The way that you edit the sudoers file is with a special command called vi-sudo, or vsudo. vi is a text editor, and I'll show you a couple of commands with it. Now I want to be very clear, again this is an opinionated class, vi is only one of the many text editors on Linux. Three of the most popular ones are VI, or sometimes Vim, Nano, and Emacs. I recommend experimenting with these and figure out which works for you. Now, VI sudo is a way to edit the sudoers file using the VI text editor. There might be other ways to do it, but I honestly don't know them off the top of my head. Now, to edit the elevated privileges file, well, you probably want elevated privileges to do that, and by probably I mean require. So, we can do sudo vsudo to run the vsudo command to edit the sudoers file. Now this is one big file with lots of possible configurations. You can read about online all the different configurations that this file supports and all of the expectations it has for format and ordering of things, but for our purposes we're just going to make sure that this new user we created has the ability to run with elevated privileges. So once you open this file, you're going to hold shift and hit G that's a shortcut to bring us to the bottom of the file. Now this line right here that our cursor is at shows that the EC2 user has access to all commands, yes all of them, and it can execute commands with no password. Which commands? 
all of them. So this is why we're able to do sudo when we're not prompted for our password each time, which is an additional, secu an additional security measure. So we want to copy this for our new user. Now we're just going to use a couple of shortcuts here. VI has many, many, many shortcuts. I'm not going to teach all of them. That would be a class in and of itself. If you want to learn VI, there are many tutorials. But for now, we're just going to copy this line. To do that, you hit the Y key twice, which will copy the whole line. Then you hit the P key to paste it. Once you've done that, you can hit the I key to go into insert mode, which is what you would normally expect for a text editor. You can use the arrows to move the cursor around. And then you can replace the EC2 user with the new user that you created. Once you've done that, you can hit Escape, which will bring you back into command mode. You'll see that insert at the bottom left-hand corner has disappeared. Now, in case you made a mistake, there's a way to get out of it. If you hit colon and then Q, that will quit. However, because we've made changes to the file, we need to add an exclamation point. VI won't let you quit normally if you've made changes unless you've saved them. It's a way to make sure you don't lose your work. When you use the exclamation point with a bang, that is a forced quit, and that will exit without saving any of the changes that were made. However, if what you have looks like what we have here, except that in this case B is whatever user you created, we can instead use WQ, which is for write quit. That will write the changes we've made to the file, or save them, and then quit editing the file. Again, in the Linux world, if everything goes smoothly, nothing is stated, and so our changes went through successfully. Now, we need to test this. To do so, we need to switch to that new user and ensure that as that new user, we can run sudo, and we have the ability to do so. Now, there's a command called su, which is short for switch user, it's similar to switch user do. If you were to run su by default, with the user that you want to change to, you would be prompted for that user's password. In this case, we don't want to use a password for this new user because, well, honestly, passwords are not that secure. That's why we will be using public and private keys later on. However, since this user lacks a password, we can't just sue to them directly. Instead, the super user can switch to another user without needing to know their password. So we can do sudo and we can do sue. Now, next we're going to add a dash. The reason is that the dash loads the target user's profile. So that if we switch to another user like this beige user, we will load that user's profile. What is a profile? It's all the settings and defaults that are involved with an interactive terminal session for that user. So it'll do things like adopt their new home directory, if they have any special configurations like terminal colorings or anything like that. That will all be loaded for that user instead of the user you're moving from. So in this case, we're just going to do that. And then you provide the name of the user that you want to switch to. Now you'll notice if we look at the prompt, it has changed from EC2 user to beige, which is the user we are now logged in as. If we do print working directory, since we loaded that user's profile, it set us to that user's home directory. So now you can see we're in slash home slash beige. However, since it's the home directory for this user, it's still a tilde. Even though earlier when we were the EC2 user and in slash home slash EC2 user, that was a tilde too because for that user, it was their home directory. The same stands here. So now we need to test that we can run something with elevated privileges. So just do sudo and run some arbitrary command. The fact that we didn't get an error or round permissions means that it worked. So now we know that we have created our new user with proper elevated privileges. Now we can log out of this user by typing in exit. You'll see that it says we've logged out and our prompt returns to being EC2 user. However, there's still stuff we needed to do as that new user, so let's switch back to them.
Now, we want to create a public-private key pair for this user, just like we have for the EC2 user, so that we can log in remotely. The command to do this is called ssh-keygen. Whoops, not, S not SHH. SSH. There we go. It has a flag dash T, which tells it which encryption method to use. So in this case, we're going to use RSA, because that's just what's most common. And then, as good practice, we'll also want to tag the keys with our email. In the event that you have a server that multiple people are using and logging into, it's a good idea to tag your keys with your email so that if something needs to change on the server and the administrator needs to contact you, they have your contact info. So to do that, we use the dash capital C flag followed by the email that we want to tag our key with in quotes. So once you've done that, you can hit enter, and it'll tell us that it's starting to generate a public-private key pair, and it will begin to ask us a few questions. First it, will ask, uh, ask, ask us. First it will ask us where we want to save the key. Now it'll give us a default value here in the parentheses, so since that's a perfectly fine location, we can just hit enter, and it will use that value. Next, it will ask us for a passphrase. We can passphrase protect our key file, our private key file, if we desire. However, it sometimes makes things difficult for automation. You don't want to have to pass an automation a password every time. So we're just going to enter for no passphrase and then enter again. And then you get a whole bunch of random ASCII art. It's just kind of a way to show that what you've created was randomly generated and would be very difficult for someone to crack. It also tells us that our private key has been saved in this location and that our public key has been saved here. So now if we were to list the contents of the .ssh directory, you'll see the idrsa and idrsa.pub files. These are our private and public keys, respectively. Now. Remember earlier how I mentioned the public key is effectively your legal name so that someone knows whom they're looking for? That's our public key. Now there's a certain way to tell the server whom we want to allow to log in as this user. The way that we do this is with a specialized file called authorized keys. And that file simply has all of the public keys whose private key counterparts are allowed to log into the server as this user. So since it simply contains public keys, we can just rename this public key to the authorized keys file. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Now, another thing required for the authorized keys file is a very specific permission set. So we're going to go ahead and set the permissions on that file. Now, I'm not going to explain how this works. Permissions are a little outside the scope of this class, but just trust me that this is what will work for now. Now, if we list the contents of the .ssh directory, we'll see the authorized keys file and id underscore rsa, which is our private key file. Now, we're going to do something a little bit questionable, but since we know that we are the only ones on this server, it should be perfectly safe. We're going to move id rsa to the slash var slash temp directory. The reason being is that we only have access to the server as the EC2 user right now. And the EC2 user doesn't have permissions to get to this new user's home directory. So we need to move the file to a location that the EC2 user does have access to so that we can download it using the EC2 user. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this IDRSA file whoops, to slash var slash tmp. 
And now if we go ahead and go to the slash bar slash tmp directory and we list the contents, we will see it there. However, if we list the permissions, we'll see that the bead user owns this file. We need to make sure that the EC2 user has access to download this file. We're going to use a command called chown, or change ownership. And it takes in two arguments, well, kind of three arguments. The user that we want to change ownership to, with a colon followed by the user that whose group we want to change it to, or rather the group we want to change it to, because groups aren't necessarily tied to users, and then the name of the file whose ownership we want to change. Now, something I forgot, this is elev you must run this with elevated privileges, because it, give it, just randomly giving someone a file, you need to make sure that that's a secure operation. So now, if we do a long listing, you can see that EC2 user is now the owning user and the owning group, as compared to Beach. Now we have everything we need to go ahead and download this new private key file that we can use to log in as our new user. First, we're going to do this for Windows users using WinSCP. We'll switch over to the Mac side using SCP built into Mac machines in a short bit. So Mac users, I'm going to ask you to be patient or to simply skip ahead in the video. So Windows users, go ahead and open up WinSCP, which you should have installed earlier it should look something like this. You want to copy the host name of your server, or rather the IP address of your server, into here. And you'll want to change the file protocol to SCP. From there, you want to enter the username as EC2-user, and then we need to give it our private key, so we can hit Advanced. And then you'll see the Advanced Site Settings here. On the left side, you'll want to go down to SSH and select Authentication. From there, you'll see a, a location to enter a private key file. You can click the ellipses to browse to where that key is. Now, I saved it in my Downloads folder, so I'm going to go ahead and select Recording Key and hit OK. So, again, make sure you have the file protocol set to SCP, you have your server's IP address, the EC2 user, and we just put in the private key file, and then click Login. So at this point, you'll have WinSCP showing you on the right side your server that you're connected to, and on your left side, your local machine. So what we want to do is we want to navigate to the slash var slash tmp directory. We can click the drop down up top here and select root. From there, we can scroll down and select var. <coughs> and then we can select temp. And now you'll see ID RSA. Then on your local machine, you can navigate to wherever you want to save it to. For consistency's sake, I'm going to save it in my downloads folder. And then all you need to do is drag from right to left. And there we go. Now at this point, this is where we stopped with the meetup. We'll rejoin later for a little bit of closing discussion, including some information on how to go further if you want. But for now, we're going to switch over to the Mac side of things. Now, for you Mac folks, getting the file off of there is much easier. There's a command called SCP, or Secure Copy. Now, first we need to give it our identity file, much like we did with SSH, so you're going to do dash I and then you can click and drag your private key file and it will automatically put the path there for you. Then you want to put the file that you want to retrieve. You can, in this case, we're retrieving from the remote server, so we can go ahead and put in our server's IP address, followed by a colon to denote we're going to pull it somewhere off of that server. In this case, it's going to be slash var slash tmp slash id underscore rsa, which is exactly where we moved it to and then we're going to put it somewhere on our, on our machine. For me, tilde slash desktop works fine. 
and I believe that'll work fine on most Macs too. Now if we simply, oh, one thing we're missing though, we're logging in as a specific user. If you leave this as it is right now, it'll try to log in with whatever user you're logged on to your Mac as. So we want to do ec2-user at. Let me go ahead and change this a little bit so that the line breaks are pretty nice. Your command should look something like this. scp-i followed by the path to your private key file, followed by ec2-user at, and then the address of your server, colon, slash var slash tmp slash id underscore rsa and then some place you want to save it to tilde slash desktop is probably good enough. We'll see that the id the rsa file downloads and it gets downloaded to our desktop. Now this is where we stopped for the class so unfortunately we haven't quite gotten to the point where we can log in as the new user but if you tune in next time we'll get that set up and now we're going to rejoin the windows folks. So thank you for joining us in our class. Uh, this was the first part of the series. Uh, if you have further questions, you can either join us at the Learn to Code LA meetup, or we have a Slack channel that you can go ahead and join. The invite link is up at the top of the screen here. And Slack is just a chat service with multiple channels, including one specifically for Linux. And you can also send direct messages. You can also mention people to get their attention. Again, thank you for listening. And if you have any other questions, feel free to join us in the Slack chat. And I hope you enjoyed this. See you next time.